Excellent. All right. So again, welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm Helen Graves. For those of you that um, don't know me, I'm one of the instructional designers with CVC and at one and I am the one in nominal charge of poker and local poker stuff. So I tend to uh, take over when we do the poker norming. Um, first thing I want to do is show you our agenda, what we're going to be doing, and then also give you the date of the next norming session so you can get it on your calendar. It will be Tuesday. We alternate between Tuesdays and Wednesdays so that hopefully we're not always getting somebody when they're teaching and they can't ever come because it's always at a certain time. So next, uh, the next one will be May 17th from 10 to noon on Tuesday. Get it in your calendar. And so we're just, you see from the agenda, I'm not going to go over each thing because I know you know how to read, but I just wanted to give you a sense of, of where we're headed today. So let's go dive into announcements and updates. We have updated the submission checklist for local poker courses and made it a Google Doc so that when there are changes, it's not something we have to worry about saying, oh, you've got the old version, et cetera. It'll just be a Google Doc so that um, it's more easy to keep updated. It is now on your CVC dashboards. And let me show you what one of those looks like. Almost every college has a dashboard. Um, the few that don't probably aren't here because they are colleges for whom we have no local poker lead listed. So the presumption is they're not really involved at all. Um, oh, I have to sign in. Uh-oh, how could you not find it? Oh, I know, because I'm in the wrong profile. Sorry, I should have had this set up ahead of time and I didn't. Okay, now it should recognize me. And I just grabbed a dashboard. They're all essentially the same with a slight distinction between a college that um, is kind of either not yet really involved in local poker or is just getting their feet wet, but they're still maybe submitting courses through the Course Design Academy. And then there's course uh, dashboards that are for colleges that have already done their local poker application. So they have a slightly different submission link um, as they're going through that. But basically we've tried to put in, we put in what your dashboard is for here at the top. And then we've just put in a bunch of resources, who your college's local poker guide is. And if you hover over the name, it'll give you our email. It's always the first initial last name at cvc.edu. And then um, if you are a college that hasn't yet applied, we've got the application for it. I mean, we've just tried to put all kinds of stuff there. Oh, I'll have to tell Stacy these are not showing right now. Um, anyhow, on one that's working, it, it will show the status of courses that have been submitted, where they are in the process. And if you have had faculty attending the information meetings, which is the precursor to submitting for Course Design Academy, it will show their status as well. And then down below, some other stuff about registering for the info meeting, et cetera. So in any case, your college should have one. We've updated them. And as I said, we've got the submission checklist. Where is it? The review ready checklist here and then if you're somebody that's doing the local poker you've got the um that submission checklist all that stuff is on your dashboard so check it out as we noted at the top the dashboard is really intended as a sort of organizational tool for poker leads it's not meant to be a campus-wide thing so it's not necessarily anything you're going to be sharing with all of your faculty or anybody it's really more for you, your use, and you can decide with whom you may want to share the link, but just know it's really more for you so that you have the ability to have all these resources and get to them easily in order to share with your faculty or potential reviewers or whatever. Um, anything else I want to say about that? I don't think so. 
Okay, so let me go back here. That's the dashboards. Feedback narratives. Um, some feedback from our OEI reviewers who are looking at local poker reviews have asked us to mention that it's it's really important that you be when you're providing the feedback narrative on a course that has been locally reviewed that you as the reviewer are specific in your feedback especially in terms of the evidence that you located or didn't locate and where you located it or didn't locate it so for example what we see pretty regularly is after looking in several modules well our reviewer doesn't know where to go look and see what you were looking at so specify after looking in modules one three seven and twelve or whatever it was that will be way more useful for our reviewers to be able to corroborate your findings and along those same guy uh along that same vein it's not specified it's just kind of a community rule of thumb that it's really good to train your reviewers to think in terms of three pieces of evidence where it's possible obviously with a11 for example the um, feedback survey there's only going to be one of those but if we're talking about something like chunking or uh <clears throat> now i'm totally objectives or you know whatever it is don't just look at one module and say oh they have objectives here therefore it's aligned you want to look at several and we go for the rule of thumb of three if you're finding it in three places you can probably make an extrap or not finding it you can probably make an extrapolation so try to be thinking in terms of multiple uh pieces of evidence for a specific rubric element rather than just finding it one time and assuming that it's going to be that way all the way through hopefully i said that in a way that made sense and cheryl and sean if i'm not speaking clearly or even any of our head oei reviewers if i'm not saying something clearly please feel free to chime in helen did you want to take any questions while we're doing this or wait for a certain time no i think um I, yeah it probably makes sense to do the ones related to this right now so i'm seeing a bunch of stuff um well, several I, bit, go ahead well i didn't know you know the the topic so for example jennifer the dashboards right now seem to be all down so i just emailed stacy to check that out so yeah don't go to your dashboards right now um the one was a clarifying question about several several they wanted that and, and several and when you, several um, literally means three or more. So in this case, when we're talking, if we're talking about pieces of evidence, we'd like a reviewer to get in the habit of looking for at least three pieces of corroborating evidence rather than just one, as I was saying. It's not something that um, is written anywhere specifically. It's just kind of a norming thing that we want to get people in the habit of of looking for multiple evidence rather than a single piece. Hopefully, Sarah, um, that gives you enough to work work on. Actually, I'm sorry, this is Sarah. Can I ask a little bit uh, yeah. for more clarification? Because I think what we're what we're doing in our district, when we see the word most on the rubric, um, maybe you're only talking about the areas that say several. When we say most, we're thinking like maybe if there's three that don't have it. <laughs> have this particular evidence. Um, so are you talking only about the places that say several, there should be three or? No, any place where it's something that should be throughout the course, for example, like chunking or objectives or those kinds of things where it's not something that is an isolated thing, like the anonymous feedback survey. Obviously, there's only going to be one of those. So you're not going to be looking for it in multiple places necessarily, except for exemplary. Um, or the, uh, uh, I don't know, I can't think of another. But it's just to kind of help reviewers remember that just because something that should be happening regularly 
or in every module, just because you found it in one module doesn't mean you should say it's aligned. You want to check in several, meaning at least three modules to confirm that it really is present in the way that you think it is. And Sylvia gave the example of C8 says several, so that's at least three. Right. And C5 says most, so is more than one half of the course assessments. Yeah. And for things like objectives, it should be in every, um, as we've talked about in other norming sessions, if you find, say it's a 16 week course and you find objectives in 13 of the modules, but three of them for whatever reason, don't have objectives. You could, if you're working closely with your faculty, you could say it's aligned with a caveat and then say, we found objectives in all except for modules five, 12 and 16, you know, please add it to those and then it will be um, fully aligned. So it isn't that if, if you found it in almost everything except for one or two, that you have to say it's not aligned. You could say aligned with the caveat and let the instructor know, hey, you did a great job on everything except for these ones. Go ahead and, and fix those. Sarah, go ahead. You got your hand up. I think she was. I'm sorry. Floor. That's a stale hand. Oh, OK, <laughs> then I'm going to go ahead and take it down. And Anna uh, Shay, if you have a question, put your hand up, too, so that you get in the mix, OK? OK, Meg. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm here. Um, I was just going to say that um, it seems like in the chat, there's a little bit of um, overlap between what we're talking about here. So I want to make sure that I understand you correctly, Helen, you're talking about when a reviewer is citing evidence, right? Isn't that how we started this conversation? So when they're citing evidence for what they found to indicate that something is aligned, you need at least three pieces of evidence stated in the review. Is that what I'm hearing you saying? That would be the ideal, yes. Yeah, and okay. what our OEI reviewers are saying is really helpful, and you are right. one of them. When they go to corroborate a local review, um, to, to state it specifically. So as I started at the beginning, don't just say several modules, say which three or four modules so that our reviewers know where to look to say, yep, they're absolutely right, or oh, you know, I'm not seeing the same thing they're seeing. So thank you, Meg, for yeah. um, clarifying. I just saw like in the chat, a few people are starting to talk about those particular rubric elements that use the word several yeah. and how they think it. So I just want to make sure I knew what you're talking about. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Lene. Hi, Helen. Hi. OK, so I'm going to push a little against this. There needs to be objectives in every module. The objectives have to make sense and where the placement is have to make sense with how the course is organized. Mm -hmm. So, For instance, if I teach uh, we're on the quarter system, so say I teach 12 weeks and I have organized weekly modules but I have organized it into four units. Yes, and I thank you for clarifying because it does say in the rubric, the learning unit. So yes, if there are multiple modules in a unit, it may not make sense to have the repeat. I mean, it might, you know, an instructor could, but yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Thanks. And Anna Shea. And there we go. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. I just had a question. We have some reviews that um, the rubrics of which have already been submitted and in order you don't to have to re review. We're just trying to, as people move forward, help your reviewers remember things that are, are going to okay, be perfect. warming everybody, but you don't have to go back. Um, and you and Cheryl can talk about it, but if I'm understanding what you mean, if, if it's already been reviewed and aligned, you're not going to have to go back and re-review okay. it with different language. Okay, no. great. And Helen, Shannon wants to know, and I'm not sure if Shannon- Yeah, I, I saw yeah. that. Okay. We, that's why we have these norming sessions because it isn't possible to put in the rubric all of the explanatory language. It would end up being a 12,000 page document if we really tried to. So that's why these norming sessions are so important because there are certain things that we decide on as a community that are going to be helpful that are more or less extrapolated 
from the rubric language rather than specifically designated in the rubric language. And that's why we have these sessions regularly to help remind people and decide as a community what's going to be true um, if there's a change or anything like that. So I know um, it can be frustrating for, for people that really want it spelled out. And it's just kind of the nature of the rubric that it, it's just not possible to get to that level of specificity with every single element. Because we were also thought of as being too prescriptive at some time. So we want to give you guys some leeway. But I put in the chat the link to our resource um, that Helen put together that explains all of the items. So I'm going to show that yeah. in shortly. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, I just had a thought and it went away. Anyhow, okay. So, yeah, maybe it'll come back to me. I'll go on to the next thing. Stack survey, and I never remember what Stack stands for. I think it's System Technology Access Something. But it's the tools that the CVC is um, negotiating with the vendor for better prices as part of our system. And I believe they send out stack surveys to DE coordinators and possibly poker leads. I'm not sure. They don't always know the tools that you guys want them to be negotiating. So be sure to mention if there isn't a tool on the list, be sure to mention something that you're interested in and would like negotiating negotiated pricing for so that they can add it to the list and work with that vendor, hopefully, um, in the future. Uh, Cheryl, anything else about that? Yeah, like mm -hmm. studio, exactly. Yeah. So, um, and, and per studio, we don't know whether the funding is going to continue after this fiscal year. So, you know, I always have to foment a little bit of revolution. Um, coming from you all is going to be more meaningful to the Chancellor's Office and CVC leadership about the importance of studio in your community and for your faculty. So let them know that it's really important that the Chancellor's Office continue to keep that in their budget if that is important to you. Um, we continually reiterate that, but coming from you guys, I think we'll have a bit more, more sway. Um, and so, yeah, Ingrid, that, that's what I'm saying. There may be things that you guys have found that the stack committee isn't even aware of, so it hasn't made it to the list. So let them know of the things that you would like them to potentially add to the list. And Ali, all I know is that we don't know whether it's on the budget or not. I have not heard definitively. Maybe you guys in the consortium know more than we on the at one team, but we have just been told we don't know yet whether it's on the budget or not. Hopefully it will be because people are really getting used to it and it's got some, some good tools. Okay, so that's it about the stack survey. The poker team, your your if sometimes Stacy gets uh, requests for a list of the college's faculty who have completed the poker course. Our registration system, which is catalog, doesn't have a simple way of sorting that information. It's very time consuming for Stacy to try to look it up manually, which is what she has to do. So the best thing to do is for you to ask your faculty who has completed or not completed. You actually should have an idea of who your poker trained faculty are because you as the poker lead had to be the one to give them the registration link in the first place. So hopefully you're keeping a list. What Stacy can do, if you give her a list of specific people, she can confirm whether they've completed or not. But if you just write and say, hey, I'm at you know, college XYZ, can you tell me anybody that's ever taken the poker training? She's not gonna be able to do that. So if you send her the correct name and email address with which they registered, because that's also a problem with our catalog system. People often use Gmail or Yahoo or whatever. We have no idea what college they're with. So even if we gave you that list that Stacy manually tried to find, it wouldn't necessarily be accurate. So bottom line, 
we don't have a way to track who on your faculty has successfully completed poker manually. So we strongly encourage you to just keep a list of who you've shared, you know, who's been designated as a potential reviewer for your college and who you've given the link to the poker to register for the poker training. And then you can ask them to send you their badge upon completion so that you're able to track locally. And then if you need it periodically, hopefully not every semester, but if you need it periodically, you can send Stacy a list of who you think it is and say, can you confirm that these people are have successfully completed the course? Um, Suzanne, I, again, I don't know that, I'm, she probably could collate a list of all the successful poker trained people, but it wouldn't necessarily be indicative of which college they were at because of that issue with Gmail and Yahoo and people, you know, having using emails other than their college email. So that may also be something you want to get in the habit of doing with your faculty is having them use their college email when they register for at one or poker things so that there is a way to more easily track. And as Carol said, they may have, if they're an adjunct, maybe they took it at a different college, but they're gonna also be on your review team. So there's just all kinds of permutations that make it really difficult for us to be able to accurately track who on your campus has successfully completed the poker training. Um, did I miss a question about that, Cheryl? No, Suzanne just clarified. I mean, all faculty at all colleges as a big list. The only thing is that, you know, again, that would be something that maybe Stacy can pull, but it's easier if you ask the specific question. Are you saying yeah. because there's people that you might be dealing with at different colleges, Suzanne? Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay, yeah, and Vic Victoria is offering a suggestion. Okay, we ask that the poker lead and review team attend at least two norming sessions a year. And that's why we ask you to register so we can track that. Again, when people use a Gmail or whatever, no, actually, I think the registration asks you what college, so we're able to track it. Um, we also ask that at least two people from each college are in attendance at any given norming session. And then those two are able to pass on a relevant summary to the people on the team who weren't in attendance. We do record the meetings and people have asked if watching the recordings fulfills the requirement to attend at least two norming sessions a year. It doesn't and here's why. Passively watching a recorded meeting means the reviewer really isn't engaged mentally or emotionally. We all know that's true because we've all experienced it either with our own students or as learners ourselves. Watching a video of something, a meeting just isn't the same as being there. A big part of the purpose of getting together is the exchange of ideas and the ability to ask questions. And that can't happen when somebody's watching a recording. Additionally, we know that even if they have the best of intentions, people just aren't especially likely to actually watch the entire recording. So as I said earlier, we purposely alternate Tuesdays and Wednesdays so we can hopefully avoid conflicting with someone's teaching schedule <clears throat> so we don't feel the stipulation is burdensome. And again, we only require that two people from each term be there each time. So it could be different people. It doesn't have to necessarily be the same two every time. Um, we just, because norming is so important and we're not able to, we're kind of stuck with Zoom in terms of the distance and geographical makeup of who is involved in norming. It's just kind of the way, the way it's, uh, going on. And again, the next norming session is Tuesday, May 17th from 10 to noon. Okay, did I miss any questions in chat about any of these items? Or if someone would like to unmute and ask a question they hadn't typed yet? I think the next topic is about the certification process, which I think okay. is down on your list. Actually, I am yeah. not sure. Go so ahead. Carol was asking about 
um, what, how do you submit the courses? Uh, there was a bit of a change um, after your poker certified. Yeah, that'll be on your dashboard for yeah, those that sure. are, have already started the submission, um, the local poker certification process. So you're kind of in phase one on your dashboard. You're going to have a little thing that says local poker submission checklist and then down below it submit your courses so it'll take you to a particular so can form. i just clarify that is going to happen or that is there no it's now? it's on the dashboards now i just wait, no oh, wait, no. wait wait carol you and two other schools were in the first go around of local poker so when first three courses were submitted and aligned whether they had edits or not they were certified but what happened over the last eight months that's changed to say, once you get three courses completely aligned the first time, then you're local certified. But for you right now, until you get three courses completely aligned the first time around, we're gonna keep doing the, the two and three courses. But once they're done, then you submit one course at a time for badging. Okay, so I have some clarification. First of all, that was a surprise and i do think that you all need to communicate that a little bit more clearly. we did at the last norming we okay. did the, the second thing is um the form that's used to submit the two or three courses uh looks like the first form we use it is it is it is we and didn't so create a different wait, form yeah but then it requires having three uploads so it's like i put had no no, it requires that I. Oh, right. Upload you can just do place. anything, just anything. We don't that have a way like, to do it separate. Well, I just, all right, that just doesn't make any sense, but okay. So after I get full, after, let's say it goes through all the way and I just put in two courses, let's say they get fully, uh, they get aligned on the first go round. Then what happens? Then your campus is designated as fully. Fully certified and, and you are, this is where the change happened per CVC management. Once a campus is designated as fully certified, you are no longer submitting, we are no longer checking your reviews. You are still submitting to us so that it can be documented for the quotely application to get into the course finder but we're not doing sporadic reviews anymore to check not any local. reviews, not even part D. And then no, I because that's why we want it. That's what I think is that is missing is that once a college proves shows that, that you can know. do three courses, A through D, and there's no challenge, then we're like, go for it, baby. All right. That's great. I just, yeah. so is there going to be it. a different form that we submit like yes. our local? Okay, so it's going to be different. Now, I want to go back to the process now. Why do I have to wait to have two courses? Why can't I why can't I submit one course at a time as my faculty and reviewers complete it? Why do I have to hold on to because one? Because when we're still doing the iterative process of phase 1 where the college is wanting to get fully certified, for our purposes, it works better to have a comparative thing going on. So we want at least two courses to look at so we can see patterns and we can see things that your review team may be misunderstanding more easily than if it's just a one-off course. I, I understand you don't like it, Carol, and it's just the way we have decided is gonna work for our purposes. I'm sorry that it, it's not something you're happy about. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we, we have 14 courses through now and I'm willing to bet that there's oversights in different areas. Um, I hope it works out the way that you think, but it just seems like there's a lot of blockage to getting your local poker teams going. This kind of everything has to be perfect in three no 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 wait wait just I, I need to defend myself and others we're not at the perfect level anymore we're at minimal alignment i have gone through and normed with our reviewers to say you know what that's exemplary this is aligned and the whole purpose is now saddleback college is one of them that went through three rounds of phase one which is nine courses and they were aligned now they're 
sending one course at a time just to be badged. I do look at the rubrics to make sure that they're, you know, still giving us great information. But there is the bottleneck is not one course at a time or three courses at a time because now we're in a phase of two weeks. We get the courses, they're reviewed. I go back to the college and within three weeks, they're either aligned or going to the next round. So I, I understand the frustration of one course at a time, but another college sent in 12 courses at one time. And by the time they were reviewed, they were eight months old. So I think, Carol, I am confident these next two courses are going to be slam and kick ass. And then you're just going to be on your own to make sure that you're responsible at the college for A through D and you'll slide through. In fact, some colleges are sending like, you know, one course a day. So then you'll be able to get higher up the food chain, I guess it is. And we're with you. Thank you. Marilyn and Tony, I see your hands, but I wanna real quickly um, clarify what Jennifer is asking about. The no more spot checking means once a college has been deemed fully certified, when you're still in phase one, which means you've submitted your application, you've submitted the three verification courses that your college team said was fully aligned, but our OEI reviewers said, there's a few things we disagree on that we think are incomplete, let's work together to get those. Then, so that's where the iterative, where we're checking. But once a college, as what Carol and Cheryl are talking about, when a college submits those three verification courses, whether it be the first round, second round, third round, whatever, once you submit those three courses and they're all fully aligned, our reviewers say, yep, you have submitted fully aligned, nothing needs to be worked on, your team understands what's going on. That's when the college becomes fully certified and that's when we um, no longer are checking your courses. You're still submitting them so that, as I said, we can get them in the course finder, but we're not doing those spot checks anymore. Hopefully that clarifies, Jennifer. Okay, Marilyn. Thank you, Helen. And Marilyn, you're muted, so we're not hearing you. Sorry. Okay, I um, I, have, I have a question about section D and, and there are so many uh, elements in section D and, and each one of those elements should have three, when you when you go to review them, that they should have three examples of how is that structure. I mean, it, it seems to be a, a little excessive because the 16 elements in section D, that'd be 48. I mean, that's a lot to do. Section D is slightly different because it's, okay. And, and we're going to talk about actually we're going to talk about accessibility yeah. a little bit later. So is it OK, Marilyn, if we hold on to that and then address it then? Because it always opens up a whole can of worms and there's a couple things we want to get to before that. OK, OK. I have one last question. Uh -huh. uh, I, I'm the new poker lead for my college. And so I just want to make sure we have three courses that I think have been certified. So when I go to the dashboard, does it say certified right next to, to it or? It, it, there's a section and now I don't remember what it's called, but it's like course status or something like that. And it's gonna show the course number and name, the instructor name, and then it'll have a status column. Um, and I believe it either says aligned. It's or, just aligned for the yeah, course. It just says aligned yeah. or okay. in review or whatever the, you know, or submitted, right. whatever the status is. So, that, so going forward, uh, with the, we have other courses, we have 32 other courses. that You'll be able to see at a glance where things are in the process. But we, we do we do we need to submit those 32 courses to you or do we can we just align them as a as, a, as our college because we're now certified or once a college mm -hmm. is fully certified, you will be reviewing and aligning the courses locally. OK, I, maybe and I didn't pose my question correctly, Helen. I'm sorry. How do I know if my my core my college is fully certified? Not what the college. College. What, what college? college? Uh, Merit. Is so, that you, Cheryl, or Sean? It's Sean. But if you go to the dashboard and see that the submission form says phase one, yes, then you're not fully certified. Yeah, not fully certified. And that's yeah. that's again the whole idea is that we want you all to be fully certified, which in turn defines your team can align A through D, the course is fully accessible. That's all we need. 
It's just aligned. It's a great course and it's fully accessible. So I hope that we don't get into the, the weeds of how many courses it is because you, I've got a college that's on round five of phase one because they're still norming. One college. And we know that's going to happen. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt one second because it, it it's not a shame thing. It's just no. the teams are changing. I mean, there's all kinds of things. We just want to make sure the team that is working at your college is really solid. Sorry, Cheryl. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's not like a bad thing. It's just, you know, even at your local team, your courses. I don't think that all of your reviewers are agreeing the first time around. I could be wrong, but they're usually a little bit of chatter. And then you come to a, an agreement or, a, a, you know, a norming. And that's what we want you to practice and get good at before we say, yeah, we're just going to badge your courses. Because in the long run, we know that sometimes people are going to get a little bit, you know, that's all right. We'll just push it through because I've seen it and I, I understand that wholeheartedly. We're just trying to make sure that it's only the little things that might be slipping through, not the things that like accessibility that could come come back and say, well, you said the course was you know fully accessible. And and again, it's all on we we believe in all of you a hundred percent. We just want to make sure that you're you getting the support you yeah. need to have yeah. your team really be solid. Right. And we and again. We're not into pickiness at all anymore. It's like I am no. a line. No. Now, CDA is different because we're working with one on one instructors and we want them to make sure they understand exemplary and, and the process. But but basic, that's it. That's all I'm going to say. You're all doing great. Let's continue. OK, and one Tony. second, Tony and Leslie. Davina, there isn't a set number of courses to become fully certified. You're correct. It's frozen cookies or pastry. I'm. I'm not sure who's talking, and I think maybe it was to somebody else. Um, and so, and neither is there a set number of rounds of submissions. What we're looking for and wanting to work with your review team on is when you submit a round of co verification courses, whether that be the first set of three or it's maybe a second round of two or three, when you submit it to us, they're fully aligned. Our reviewers, our OEI reviewers agree. Yes, these courses are fully aligned. We don't find anything that we would consider incomplete. That's when your college is fully certified. If you're submitting verification courses where the OEI reviewers are saying, gosh, we found this to be incomplete or, you know, a couple of when they're finding incompletes, that's when we work with you to get those courses aligned. But we're going to ask you to submit another set of verification courses, because what we're looking for is to support you until you are submitting what we refer to as clean courses. They're fully aligned when they come to us. Hopefully and, that makes sense. Well, and I think the, one of the other challenges is that round two or three or four. Don't worry be, about it. It can be two or three courses because some of our districts, they have to send in three courses because there's three colleges. So it could say two or three. And I know that there's a little bit of confusion about that. So round two. Talk to your local poker yeah. guide if you have questions. Tony, did you just give up or did you decide you didn't need to say what you were going to say? Well, no, it was just kind of that sidebar when you mentioned Canvas Studio, and I would like to write a note to the chancellor's office or whoever, whoever I need to write it to because I love Studio and how easy yeah, it is to make things. A lot possible. of people do. And so I had put in the chat if anyone has a contact, um, and then there was a lot of uh, um, URLs for like the, um, the stack and stuff, and I didn't know if those were the right links to, to search for someone to contact. So if anyone has a contact, or I could write them a message. I just really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, there's so many vice chancellors in the chancellor's office. I actually don't know which would be the one, um, but maybe somebody else has an idea of who would be the appropriate. I suppose Marty Alvarado would probably be the most likely one and maybe copy Jory or whoever his interim replacement is going to be. Hi, Kitty. OK, Leslie. Good morning. Um, so my question is that when just trying to get over that hump of being local versus being fully certified is that, you know, when we've sent in a couple courses by, let's say, one instructor, the one with identical 
organization, identical everything, these two courses, but one reviewer um, at, at your end says it's aligned and another says it's incomplete. We're not exactly sure where to go from that point when the two courses are identical. Is it CDA or is it local poker? Because local poker only gets one reviewer yeah, on our side. Yeah. Yeah. We, don't get two. we turned them in in two rounds. So in one round, Oh, oh. Uh, well, let me ask. Uh, I don't have an answer. That would be a case by case. So we'd have to delve into that. That's one of the reasons these norming things are so important for our reviewers as well as locals so that everybody's got the same understanding of what aligned means for a thing. But we all know there, there is even then a, a bit of subjectiveness in somebody's. And we are continually... Um, Tony and Sylvia and, and, you know, whoever I can't, Leslie, they can attest to that we're continually working with them, especially as we get, I won't say pressure, as we get communications from CBC to not be so picky. We're, we're trying to not be so picky. And yet we also, I mean, it, it's, there's just, going to be discrepancies. So Leslie, that may be something you want to talk with your poker guide about the specific instance to, to try to work that out. Um, and that is why we have a single reviewer or two kind of assigned to a college so that they learn the way the college does things. And they learn that that's how the college demonstrates you know, whatever it is, instead of having a different review every time, who's going to have that different filter for what it should look like. So I don't have a specific answer other than maybe talk with um, your poker guide about it. Which I, which I did and um, it was you know, awesome. Um, it, it's just that whole subjective nature just is sort of yeah. like, it, it just sort of feels like a crapshoot, you know, to go, will it, I don't know. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm the other instructor at trade that had that happen to them. Hi, Les. Um, and it was, it, it was a different, Sean was involved in it. And then it was a different reviewer in round two. And it was like in the round one, there were issues that were determined. We fixed them. We moved on. Close, classes were approved. Round two, new issues were brought up even with an identical format submission. And some, in some cases, some of the old issues that were previously addressed were brought up again, even though they had already been explained and put in as aligned. So that might be something to consider that as a CVC reviewer, they also look at what was submitted in a previous round to see if there was already an explanation for it. Um, for example, in my additional learning materials, I give them the playlist for crash course videos and tell them to find the videos that correspond to the chapter that we're learning and watch those videos if they choose to. Um, and it was like, well, maybe you should give them the exact video link. And I said, well, wait a minute. Part of history is learning how to research. I'm already handing them the website and spoon feeding it to them a little bit. They have to do some of the work, especially if it's an additional situation for enhancement. So that was explained in round one, but yet it came up again in round two. So it's kind of like a, a rabbit wheel. So a possible solution would be if it is a new reviewer in a different round, they have access to looking at the, the previously um, reviewed courses for a particular instructor so they can see what, what overlaps. Does that make sense? It does. And what we've also asked instructors to do when they're submitting is provide a little explanation to the reviewer if they're doing something that might be considered um, different than the, quote, normal way of setting it up. So that could be another way of doing it is if the explanation has already been approved, include it when you submit that course uh, or that frame a style of course again so that a new reviewer will understand the rationale okay we could go on and on about this um no, miguel is saying we should be picky yeah you know there's all kind it's a gamut a continuum of whether to be picky or not picky we're trying to find a medium that will work 
not only for people that are very busy, the reviewers and you poker leads, but also to ensure quality for our students and that our faculty are able to meet those standards. And it's just an evolution. Okay, um, a couple of resources. And Cheryl already shared one. She gave you the actual link. I have created a bit.ly in case, um, cause you know, the, the URL is always so hard to find. So you could go to the bit.ly, it will take you to course 837 in our instance of Canvas. That is the course design resources. I've shown it before, but I'll show it again. It is publicly available. It's a great resource for faculty that are aligning their courses. Uh, we've set it up so that it's got an explanation of what the aligned terminology is, what and why. Why are we asking you to do this? How does it help student learning so that faculty don't think we're just pulling something out of thin air? There is actually a reason why we're wanting you to meet this criterion. And then tips and examples. And for your purposes with Local Poker, we've added a for reviewers tab so that it gives a clue to re local reviewers. Here's where we think you're probably gonna find this kind of thing. And here's what we think you're probably gonna be looking for. Doesn't mean it's the definitive, that's the only thing you should be looking for or the only places you're gonna find it. It's just to help reviewers who are getting their feet wet um, because, you know, even though you've gone through poker training, you all know, it doesn't mean you're a stellar 100% reviewer right out of the gate. You've got to learn and, and get better at it, like riding a bike or whatever. You can do it, but you're not quite um, advanced yet until you get some practice. So we have that available as a resource to everyone. Um, Cheryl, do you mind putting the link in chat again? And then, as I said, we also have the I'll show you the slide again in a moment. The Local Poker Resource Center is where you're going to find several things. Um, I'm going to put it on. Sorry, I can't talk and copy URLs at the same time. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to. It's. Yeah. Let me stop. Okay, here's where one place you're going to find your dashboards. So if you don't know about your dashboard or you haven't ever gone there yet, you can go to the dashboards page. It is separated into the local poker guide and then alphabetical. And if it has a link, it means you've got a dashboard. So if I click here, we got College of the Deserts dashboard when it finally renders. It's taking forever. Okay, I'm not going to wait for it. Apparently, the smart sheet is having some kind of issue. There you go. So you just click on the link to get to your dashboard. The few colleges that don't have a link, as I said, those seem to be the colleges that are not really involved in any of this yet. So we don't have a poker lead to be connecting with, so we don't have a dashboard for them. The other thing you will find here on the Local Poker Resource Center is on the certification tab, which explains the steps to becoming a poker certified campus. We also have a crowdsourced set of ideas for local poker preparation, which you guys all, um, we talked about it, I think two or three norming sessions ago, and then several colleges have sent in stuff. So we're adding to it as people send things, but it's just, a Google Doc with a bunch of different ideas and the person that you might contact at that college if you have questions about what it is they're doing. The other thing you'll find here on the home page, down at the bottom, let me make you dizzy, are all of the links to the past recordings. So you can share that with reviewers. We try to get it uploaded within 24 hours and then captioning usually takes another you know, three or four days. Um, but we try to get up, get them up there right away for people that were not able to attend. And the last thing I want to share with you, let me get rid of these, the poker training participant agreement form. <clears throat> As you probably know, we don't make this public because the poker training is only for potential reviewers 
for the local colleges. It's not for just any faculty who want to learn about the rubric. We have other courses if people want to learn about the rubric or the course design resources shell or whatever. This is just for potential reviewers. So we ask that the poker lead at the college be the one to share this link with people they have identified as potential reviewers. We don't share it with people, even if they write and say, I'm at whatever college and I've been told to be on the review team. Can you? We don't because in all honesty, we've had at least one college get mad at us because they said, that is not somebody we want on our team. And I'm really sorry you shared the link with them. So we don't want to get involved in any of that. So we want to have you have the um, ability to determine who you would like to be a potential reviewer. And so you can share the uh, participant agreement link with them. You will find the link on your dashboard. You also may already have it bookmarked. I send it out a lot. Please remember to only share it with potential reviewers, not faculty at large. And also remind potential reviewers not to share their enrollment link with colleagues for the same reason. You want to be able to have oversight about who is going to become a potential reviewer. So, um, and it's a two-step process. They're going to fill this out. They're going to indicate which date is the one they want to register for. And then they're going to get an email with the actual registration link. So be sure and let them know just filling out the form doesn't mean they're enrolled. Every time we do poker, we have at least one or two people writing to say, I don't see it on my dashboard. And it's because they never actually clicked the registration link in the follow-up email. So they're not actually registered. So I reiterate constantly, and I'm asking that you let them know very, very clearly it's a two-step process. Um, okay, before we go into rubric stuff, any questions about any of the resources that I shared? And let me put these here in case somebody wants to take a screenshot of bit.ly links so that you can get there easily. And yes, Marilyn. Yeah, I, I was a question. I, I appreciate the fact that uh, uh, that you you uh, recognize that it's, it's that campuses don't want everyone to just get into these courses. But have you been notified? Because I don't think anyone on my campus, everybody think, thinks that they could take the course at any time. I, I mean, I, I, is that something that's been really been communicated really well, or? It, 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 it's something we communicate every norming session uh, pretty much. And oh. whenever I send reminders or things, I'm frequently saying the poker lead is the one who shares the link to the participant agreement. You're the one who you, meaning whoever the poker lead is, you're the one who gets to determine who you want to share that with. So okay. I think it's been made pretty clear, but maybe since you're an incoming poker lead, maybe the um, your predecessor didn't think to share that information with you. I, okay. I don't know. Okay, well, I appreciate it because I, I mean, I have uh, instructors who have asked about being in the course and I didn't, I don't know if, if my campus has set up any kind of screening process. Yeah, and, and every campus may be different in that regard. And that may be something, um, <clears throat> if we have time at the end for just kind of open chat, that may be something that people want to share about is if you, are doing criteria or you know that kind of thing but all we do is say we want the local poker lead to be the one to determine who gets the link we don't determine the criteria you may have for who you want on your review team so was there a time where you could just go to the oei uh, website and just register nope we've never made that link public okay thank you <clears throat> yep okay Let's talk about some rubric stuff, some norming topics. One that came up, because I asked people to share things that they felt either they had questions about or their team or you know, just an OEI reviewer saying, here's what I see, kind of a theme in courses that are being submitted, was the idea of chunking. And so um, somebody had a question about <clears throat> norms for page length especially in Canvas, and if there's a maximum page length that makes, <clears throat> sorry, I have allergies, 
as the rubric terms it, online reading difficult in A6 or in A7 where it reduces the labor intensity of learning. We don't have a specific length, you know, however many um, scrolls or however many inches or anything like that. My rule of thumb, and hopefully it makes sense, if I need to scroll, I think there should be a little bit of chunking. If it's a short little page, no big deal. It may not need headings. In terms of how long is too long, we used to kind of recommend that, you know, a little bit of scrolling, but if there's a lot of scrolling, then you might want to break it into two pages or you might want to have tabs on the page. What Michelle Pekansky Brock shared with us as an anecdotal sort of research study they did with students who are faculty like you in their um, STEM Equity Academy, they were saying they preferred not to click, that they would rather scroll a long page than click a bunch of times to get to all of the information. So what our reviewers really are looking for more now than the length of a page is the usability of a page. So is it chunked? Are there section headings? Are there, is the list tool made use of properly? Are there images? Are there things that, that break it up from being one long chunk of text? That's what we're talking about when we talk about makes online reading difficult or reduces the labor intensity is not a specific length, but is it easily, because the eye online doesn't read the same way it does in a book. Pages and pages of a block of text is not that big a deal in a book, but online it's very hard for the brain to process. So we just want to get instructors trained to chunk their content um, without being tied rigidly into a specific page length. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, is And I see a bunch of stuff going by in chat that I can't process quickly, but is there a question about this or uh, Bethany? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, that was just, again, something that came up in my round two, because I do have a page where you might have to scroll a few times, but everything is divided up in headers. Because I remember a while ago, we had a, a norming session. I can't remember who put up the page where they were demonstrating how you can have a very long page, as long as it is broken up with headers or uses images so that there is a break for the reader's eye. Mm -hmm. Um, and yet it was something that came back to me by a reviewer saying that I should consider using multiple pages rather than one long page. I said, no, wait a minute. We already went over this in norming a long time ago and all of my headers are in place and properly formatted. So I just wanted to share that experience. And yes, it was, it, it was fixed, uh, or the review was fixed without any big drama, but, um, it might be something that you want to share with the CBC review team that there was a problem with that particular item. Thank you. Um, and I see stuff about tabs and accordions. Yeah, it, my understanding is they are accessible if they're set up properly. And depending on the screen reader device, you know, there's all kinds of things that go into it, even if something is, is set up properly. Anything else about chunking? Okay. The other thing, whoops. The other thing somebody sent in a suggestion about to, for us to chat was uh, C5, which is about rubrics. And it says rubrics or descriptive criteria in most or all assessments. And so they were saying, well, how do we achieve consistency in determining whether an assessment needs grading criteria or a rubric? Because for example, as they pointed out, um, you know, a self-assessment, it may not be graded it, or, or it may have points, but it's not really a right or wrong kind of thing. So it doesn't have grading criteria necessarily. Um, significant assessments should have grading criteria. So this is something that 
isn't specifically spelled out in the rubric language, but is the point that is being made. If something isn't being graded, obviously it doesn't need rubric or grading criteria, even if it's an assessment per se. And so for all of us as norming, whether we're local poker or OEI or whatever, to be aware that the most or all allows that leeway for assessments that really aren't something that needs grading criteria. Um, but the things that really do need grading criteria where a student wouldn't necessarily understand what it is they're going to be evaluated on, that's where you want to make sure the instructor knows this really could benefit from either a rubric or grading criteria. And Sean or Cheryl, did I miss a question about this in chat or is there anybody that has a, a comment about this or a question? Just a little side convo about design plus, so. Okay, all right. And part of why it's hard in the rubric is because assessments can be set up in so many different ways and with so many different goals. So it's hard to be prescriptive in the rubric to say, this kind of assessment has to have a rubric or grading criteria. This kind of assessment should never, you know. So we just want as a group of reviewers to understand that there may be a distinction between an assessment that's present, but really isn't gonna be graded in a way that needs explanation or something that would need explanation for the student to understand. Okay. And next thing somebody wrote about, whoops. C8, and this has the whole several opportunities for student self-assessment with feedback are present. And as we've talked today and at other norming sessions, we have, as a group, have um, determined that several in a full length course means at least three. If it's a short course, you know, eight weeks or five weeks or whatever, two would be fine. And Sylvia, I don't know, uh, uh, well, I just said your name, so I'm calling you out. She wanted to um, point out that a really great guideline for reviewers is to first look for self-assessment opportunities that aren't graded. So whatever that might look like that the instructor is doing, maybe it is a muddiest, clearest point or something like that, but it's not graded because they don't have to be graded. They can mm -hmm. be graded or ungraded. It's just that they're present and that they had feedback opportunities. So then if you're looking for ungraded stuff and you don't find any, or you only find one, then you can start looking at low stakes assessments like a practice quiz or something like that. But keep in mind that not every assessment involves self-assessment. Um, and it needs to have a feedback mechanism. That's crucial that the instructor realize that. It can't just be a practice quiz where they're told right or wrong. The instructor needs to either somehow communicate to the student, whether it be with the customized feedback in Canvas or whatever way they wanna do it, um, guidance. If the student messed up on a particular topic or concept or whatever, don't just say, no, you got it wrong. That's not gonna help them in assessing what they need to do differently. So there has to be that, that specific feedback provided by the instructor, whether it be built in or um, on the spot kind of feedback. And in the course design resources that I showed you previously, there is, and you can share this with your instructors who maybe are grappling with C8. We have a page on C8, <clears throat> that explains the what and why and the tips and examples and a lovely video from Tracy about um, guidance she provides faculty that are working with this and then a bunch of examples of how they might incorporate it in their course and then some specific C8 things that give even more uh, detailed ways that they could be providing self-assessment in their course. So lots of resources for faculty to use when they're grappling with this. Questions or comments about C8? It's sometimes a big topic.
Okay. If I didn't explain it clearly, please let me know. But now we're going to go oh, for crying out loud. My thing is not working. Um, Section D accessibility. First thing I want to mention is Pope Tech. For those of you that are not yet aware of Pope Tech or you're on the fence or you haven't enabled it yet, it is a godsend for faculty in terms of reviewing their courses for accessible formatting in Canvas. It doesn't do external documents, but it's beautiful in Canvas. And we have, oh, do I have this open? I don't. Well, I'll just tell you and maybe. I'll grab it. Okay. Um, there's a bite-sized canvas about it that explains what it is, why it's fabulous, and how you request it for your college. Pope Tech is being offered, it's being sponsored by the CCC Accessibility Center. So it is free to all colleges. And Dawn, who is the head of the CCC Accessibility Center, has said she values it so much she intends to fight tooth and nail to keep it in her budget. So she has no plans for it to go away um, in the foreseeable future. So it's free to you, but your college does have to request that it be enabled in your college's instance. It's a very easy, quick process. Your IT person doesn't need to freak out about it because it does not compromise security at all. Um, and good, all these people are saying, I mean, Pope Tech really is a game changer for faculty. It's just fabulous. Um, and so go watch the bite size and use it as evidence for whoever you need to convince on your campus that this is going to be great for your faculty. But they once it's there and available and they know how to use it, it's going to be um, fabulous for them. In terms of accessibility and Marilyn, here's where we can address your question in terms of evidence. Section D is a little bit different than A through C in that either headings are properly formatted or they're not. And section accessibility needs to be addressed on every page in the course, all the Canvas pages, not just the overview pages or not just assignments and quizzes. Everything needs to be made accessible, all the content. And so a reviewer for your purposes doesn't necessarily need to review every page of the course. But what we recommend is they review a minimum of three modules, the entirety of three modules, so they can see, does this instructor use properly formatted things? Are they using the list or are they just putting dash space? Are they doing alt text correctly? All of the things that are involved in accessibility and that you also communicate to the faculty that every page of their course, somebody needs to have eyes on it because the overview pages may all be formatted properly, but the rest of the pages aren't. So the reviewers don't have to look at every page, but you need to look at enough. And again, we think at least three modules, it gives you a sense of whether this instructor knows how to format properly for the specific things or not. So it's different than the three pieces of evidence kind of thing. It's kind of a, an all or nothing. Yes, I, I've seen enough evidence that I can tell they know how to format headings or no, they're not formatting headings properly. We need to teach them how to do that. So Marilyn, does that answer your question about section D being different from, well, you didn't ask it about, but how it is different from the way a reviewer might approach sections A through C? Yeah, I think you answered my question. My question was really about giving three examples for each. Yeah, so it's it's kind of different. Um, what we do ask, though, for the instructor's benefit and also for our reviewers is give some examples of where you found either proper headings or improper headings. So, and it could even be, I looked, I reviewed modules one, five, and seven, and I found headings consistently done properly, but alt text was not done properly. So we know where the reviewer looked to determine whether a particular criterion was aligned or not. 
you don't have to say specific pages necessarily um, unless a specific page is relevant for whatever it is the reviewer is describing. Anything else about section D that, that people are maybe having trouble with? Oh, before, before I open it up, I'm sorry. Um, and Meg, let me, let me get to you and then I'll go back to, because there was another question about D. So yeah, now you want me to ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I just want to clarify when you're saying looking at three units to kind of assess <clears throat> how well the instructor is right. addressing accessibility, that's for a peer review, but not for like submitting for badging, correct? I'm huh? not sure I understand. So when a peer is reviewing for our local poker, uh -huh. we want them to look at or, or submitting them for CVC OEI. If, if you're just a peer doing a review, you yeah. want them to look for those three units. But if a local poker is submitting a course. Somebody should have looked at every page every, in that course, course, whether yeah. it be the instructor or like I'll do in course design academy, I'll split it up with the instructor. So mm -hmm. they're doing half, you know, but yes, before you say the course is fully aligned and give it to us, somebody has to have looked at the course in its entirety. Yeah, and I've that, seen that distinction was clear. Right. Yeah. And I've seen yeah. so many colleges now that are getting the tools, whether they have ally, they will look at their dashboard and then they'll look at the files folder of the instructor's course and say, hey, you've got some red dials. Now, this very minimum and you know that it's not 100 percent, but then they would go to maybe Pope Tech and do the same thing. That's the page by page. The colleges that use you do it have the advantage to get a report. And I've seen that a lot of colleges now incorporate that into their training of their faculty and reviewers. But if you train your faculty in the beginning to check all these resources that you might have, you do it comes out most comprehensive in where the instructor could look. And that could also help your reviewers. So those are tools that your reviewers, whomever they are, whether they're, you know, accessibility specialist or everybody, um, the more that they're aware of where the in, infractions might be, the easier they are to fix. Yeah. Uh, Martin. Hi. Hi. Um, so I, I'm doing, I, I just joined um, San Joaquin and doing the reviews in, in Section D and accessibility. And I historically have been well, well versed in WCAG and WCAG requirements. And where I have trouble is when I see discrepancies between what an accessibility checker says is wrong and what the law actually says. So like, for example, accessibility checkers tend to list best practices and say, well, this is in violation or this is an error because you have 121 characters right. in your alt tag, but right. that's not a law, that's a best practice. Right. So the way the standard is worded is it makes it sound like you're violating or, or make sure you address everything in the accessibility checker. But quite frankly, I don't always agree with the accessibility checkers. So how do I mm -hmm. indicate that? Just in your notes, that's what I've seen as the best way to do it because they're all imperfect, lots of false positives. As you said, you do, it will list every video even though they are captioned. So- And, and they do that because they, they can't check captioning. So they want the instructor to know they have to go in and look at the captioning. But yeah, for sure. If you just say in, in anywhere in your notes, and I like the colleges that are putting in a hidden module at the top of their course notes with these the notes in it that says, hey, this is a little bit different than maybe what you've seen before. Or I, how about the one in Pope Tech, is it Pope Tech or no, Ally? It'll say that the alt text is wrong just because it's the same as the name of the file without the JPEG. And it's like, no, it says, you know, green hornet's nest or whatever. So those things are going to be something that um, you can help us with by explaining. And a lot of stuff we realize is not a hard and fast. So if somebody has a little bit longer alt text than what is considered the best practice, we're not going to say that's on a line as long as the alt text is appropriate to the context. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to make you stress out about that kind of thing as long as what's being done is appropriate. It's when an instructor may not realize mm -hmm that alt text shouldn't be an entire, you know, 
right. 7,000 words or their alt text simply says picture. Okay. That's when we're going to um, um, make comments can, on it. If I, can, if I can then just go another direction then too, I would, I'd like to talk about PDFs a little bit and what, what processes and checkers are, are being used to actually declare a PDF to be accessible because as you know, uh, you know, it's it's virtually impossible to to yep. please every aspect of Adobe yep. to make a PDF accessible. There's a certain limit where you have to say, you know, these are the basic attributes and these are in place and this is going to have to be acceptable. Yeah, we we don't have a definitive answer to that, Martin. And what we do is our little triage song of canvas pages are best. Word is probably second best. PDF is a PIA, so avoid them like the plague. And there are times when you have to do a PDF. So, well, if instructors it, want to use a tool like Hypothesis, so students can interact with that PDF and annotate it and everything, a Canvas page is not a substitute. Right, right. And there's all kinds of permutations. We're just doing yeah. the best we can and trying <laughs> to help instructors start thinking about accessibility because a lot of them, it's just not yet in their um, right. everyday awareness. Right. So thank you. And I'm going to get to you. Is it Li Huang? I'm not sure I'm saying your name correctly. I'm going to get to you in one second. But um, we had a question in chat that was also one that got sent to me about if there's an inaccessible web page, and this is the way I understand the question. If there's an, a website that the instructor wants to send students to, but it's not accessible, can they copy that content and put it on a Canvas page and format it for accessibility? And is that okay? But what are the copyright repercussions of that? I'm not a copyright expert. Generally, your librarians are the best people to go to with those kinds of questions. What I can say is just kind of a, a basic guideline is if something is being cited as a source, it's not just the content was grabbed off the web page and plopped on a Canvas page and the student would have no way of knowing that it isn't the instructor's content or where the content came from. It needs to be cited and properly formatted. Um, that may be acceptable. My accessibility friends always tell me that accessibility trumps copyright but that doesn't mean instructors get to plagiarize to their heart's content. Um, you know, you need to be mindful of what it is you're doing with somebody else's content, even though it is behind the password protected uh, wall of Canvas and it is being used for accessibility purposes, both of which help legally make it not be a, a flagrant copyright violation but check in with your campus librarians to get their sense on what your campus guidelines are. Because again, with 114 colleges, there's not a single guideline that we can give that's gonna necessarily meet what every college is saying they want their faculty to do in those terms. So um, I don't know, Marianne, if that is responding enough to your question, and if not, feel free to unmute and say more about it. But that's what I can say, uh, Cheryl or Sean, or if there's a, a really top-notch accessibility person, you have something else to add about grab. Another, before I have you guys go, another thing to suggest to the instructor is they may have an inaccessible web page that they're sending students to for a particular resource or whatever. Maybe find a different resource that gives similar or the um, comparable resource, but it is accessible. You don't only have to send students to that one resource. If there is another one available that is accessible, then that web page is fine. You just identify for students. Here's two resources. This is the one that's accessible so that a student who needs, uh, whether for vision or hearing or whatever, they've got a way of getting comparable information even though it's not on that website that some other students may be going to. Thanks, Helen. Um, my question is partially is answered. Thank you so much. Also, let's say on an MLA, MLA format in uh -huh. which I need to state the whole entire uh, URL, right, the URL 
And then Pope does not agree right. with that, right? It's not supposed to be a URL, but a link. Yeah. So what yeah. do we do in that situation? Um, it is a conundrum that we have been talking about amongst ourselves and other people can chime in. I'm kind of thinking if, because generally speaking, you're talking about the MLA and it's down at the bottom in a little section that's labeled um, citations or whatever. And so it's it's down Correct. there. Correct. So the student who is using a screen reader, presumably the instructor has labeled that section citation. So the student will understand this is something different than regular content. And I don't need the citations. I'm not going to go read it or whatever. So it's a little bit different than having a URL being used in the midst of the page where the student is trying to understand or needs to go to that link. Um, another way to set it up is to have the live link be the title of the citation. And then in brackets, just plain text is the URL. So a cited student could copy that URL if they needed to, it's there but it's not gonna be read out loud to the student who's listening on a screen reader device. Does right. that make in sense? A, in a bracket, like, like the- Right, in brackets. Yeah. So it's yeah. present, but it's not a clickable link. It's just gotcha. text. I gotcha, thank you so much. Yep. Okay, Li Huang, do you still have a question? Well, my question um, may be kind of cross between section D and navigation. Uh -huh. uh, but it's really in about adopting an, uh, an OER textbook. So OER textbooks, some of them have already uh, integrated directly into um, right. Canvas, right? So it show up as a series of links to the pages of the book. So it's really nice navigation for the student because they can just do next previous as needed. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, when we learn about uh, page navigation and accessibility, we want to put that link, the text, the link to a textbook or a chapter mm -hmm. in the page as we explain what that page is about. Right. But there's an argument that I received that no, it's really for accessibility. We should just put a page with a description, whatever we say to teach about that chapter, but leave the links alone so that the student can do next and previous. Um, that's easier for navigation. So I don't know whether you have an opinion because it seems to be a cross between a navigation issues and an accessibility issue. Yeah, um, it, it, it's not something that will determine alignment or inalignment. It's more whether the content is accessible that we're, but uh, it's kind of a design decision. Okay. I tend to go for what's going to make it easier for the student. And it may be that going directly into um, Lumen Learning or whatever it is where they have the next button, that may be easier. And, and so I'm letting the students know you're going into Lumen Learning, come back here when you finish your reading, but they've got the ability to use the next button. Other people prefer to have a link for each chapter or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really more of a design decision. Do, does somebody else have a really strong feeling about that you wanna share? I can share that with AI. Uh, I have checked with AICC and they have very strong uh, feelings about it. So I have to share. Again, it's very clear the same message that is up to the designer of the course, uh, but uh, they prefer to leave the link to the chapter as a, in, you know, as a separate link and then put a text of the explanation above it because they believe that is better from the experience. I just want to share that. It's not yeah. just, well, that's their formal opinion. Uh, I mean, formal position, I think like that. I just want to share right. my experience. Right. Uh, so, okay, so I just, my, my question is really about confirming that it's not part of the review of alignment or non-alignment of the rubric. So, okay. Yeah, we don't insist one way or the other. What we're really looking for is, is it clear to students what's happening with these links or that they're being sent you know, to whatever? Uh, are students that maybe aren't so quick on the uptake being given the context that they need in order to interact successfully with whatever it is? Okay. All right, yeah. thank you. Great. Bethany. Um, I'd like to put out something for consideration as well with respect to using um, textbooks in the classroom and the idea of linking to a specific chapter versus linking to the entire text. Um, 
I, I kind of go both directions on, yes, it's easier for students if we link them to the chapter that is being studied. However, I think our students are losing the ability for how to actually use a textbook. Does that make sense? Because if they're just constantly given a link to a, chap a chapter, then they are not a, they're not being taught how to use an index, mm -hmm. how to use a glossary, how to use uh, appendices. Um, so this is something else to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, in the design the, of what the instructor- In the design on how you're doing, because I, I, again, experienced with a comment made in a review and I went and I explained it saying, look, you know, they need to know how to use a textbook. <laughs> So something to you know mm -hmm. also take into consideration for the group. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to look at chat real quickly. Sill, you cannot rely on the accessibility and checker in Canvas for anything except color, tables, and a little bit to do with image alt text. It will uh, alert you if you've got the file type on it or if you've got the word image in it but it won't be able to discern whether other alt text is appropriate or not. So, you know, but in terms of headings, it's not reliable. Um, color, no, I said color and tables, it's, it's good, but you know, it's getting better. It's better with recognizing a potential list and things like that. So you can use it as one of your tools in an accessibility toolbox, but it can't be your only tool and you can't rely on it when it says, yay, it's accessible, you can't actually rely on that page being fully accessible. I'm sorry to say. That's why we're recommending additional tools like Pope Tech and you do it and things like that. Um, but the accessibility, the accessibility checker in Canvas is getting better. Uh, Whitney, no, there is currently not a live plan to integrate accessibility into A through C right now. Maybe it'll happen a little bit later. I'm um, looking through. Is there a question somebody wants to ask that I missed in chat? Feel free to. Cynthia just said when we're finished with the D, she had a publisher question. Okay, great. Oh, and I think um, Vivian said, you know, publisher stuff. It's a big one. Um, We can't go in and determine, I mean, we, we can look at publisher stuff, but generally speaking, whether publisher content is accessible or not needs to be determined at the college level. And so our best guideline is for colleges to determine the accessibility of particular publisher content before instructors start adopting it or departments start adopting it um, but it is legally any content the student is expected to interact with as part of the course, that content is supposed to be accessible. But of course, the instructor can't make the publisher content accessible. So it's a, a sticky wicket, but it, it could prevent a course from being deemed aligned if that content is not accessible. I don't know. Um, Vivian, if that's what you were looking for, or if there was a specific question you had about publisher content in terms of accessibility, feel free to unmute if there is. Um, and I'm looking through a question. How about audio? Okay. So captioning, I assume, with with is what you're talking about. If here's my understanding. If it's a PowerPoint that's text only but the instructor is narrating it you know they're reading what's on the slide i don't think as long as that is clarified to the student who is potentially hard of hearing and doesn't hear what the as long as it's clarified that they're not missing anything in the audio that it is basically the powerpoint itself is the transcript of what the instructor is narrating Wait. not a problem um, same with a video. If it is a talking head, which we pray to God instructors are not doing talking head videos, but if it is a talking head video, there's no nothing else going on, a transcript could suffice. 
if there's anything going on on the screen, it needs to be on screen captions because imagine you're a student looking from the transcript to the screen, to the transcript, to the screen. That's like cognitive overload by definition. And so there are times when a transcript may be a, a, um, appropriate for a video, but it's very rare. And there may be times when a transcript isn't needed for, as an example, a captioned PowerPoint. But those would be exceptions rather than the rule. Marianne, does that make sense as to why, if, you know, as long as it's clarified that the instructor isn't giving and the instructor understands, they're not giving any other information than exactly what's written on the screen. Correct. That's not a problem. Correct. But if they're if they're lecturing over a PowerPoint, correct. that has to be totally different. That needs mm -hmm. transcript. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Right. You just want to make sure that it's comparable for both students. The hearing student and the non-hearing student are getting the same information. It may not be in the same way. So the hearing student is watching the PowerPoint and listening at the same time. The non-hearing student is simply reading what's up, but they're getting the same information. One doesn't have an inadvertent advantage over the other. Um, yeah, the default colors in Canvas. And when you say the default text colors, I'm thinking maybe you mean, and I'm not sure how to say your name properly, so I'm going to maybe butcher it. Tejal? Tejal? I apologize. Um, the link text, the blue that is the Canvas default blue for links is slightly less than what is considered an accessible contrast. My accessibility friends have told me it's not enough of a difference that instructors have to go in and change the color of every single link in their course. But it is something that we would love the CCMS committee to talk to Canvas about and say, people, please make your link text fully accessible. Yeah, so we that have we don't 100 times. These we have 100 messages. times, yeah. But I think that it's getting around now because there's a new accessibility lead at, at Instructure. So we're oh, hoping good. that that will, will change. But again, it's not the hill to die on. Yeah, yeah. And if a college changes their own link text, which some colleges do, they'll use one of the college colors, then you need to make sure that the college IT person or whoever it is that sets the color, you need to make sure that that color does have sufficient contrast. The instructors won't be able to change it but you would talk to the IT or get your Canvas admin or whoever it is and let them know the requirement about a sufficient contrast. So maybe it can't be exactly the college color, um, but it does have to have sufficient contrast. Uh, okay, anything else that I'm, oh my gosh, there's 65 things to scroll through. Anything else about accessibility? Um, that anyone wants to bring up for discussion? Ellen, real quick. Um, yes. You know, after our conversation, because I know you and I had a one-on-one -on -one about different accessibility checkers, and I think yeah. it's worth mentioning, um, I, I by no means get paid by Pope Tech, obviously, but <laughs> um, it's worth mentioning, like you had told me that Pope Tech for things like alt text, uh, it does it at the HTML level. So when you do copy Canvas courses from one term to the next, everything comes with you. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I did accessibility with Ally at a previous institution, we were um, dismayed to find out that yeah. alt text had to be redone, redone for all of yeah. that kind of stuff. And I think you mentioned that you do it as the same way. It doesn't always come over but Pope Tech definitely comes over 100% of the time. Yeah, Pope Tech is integrated right into Canvas. So if the instructor is using the little fix it panel in Pope Tech, it's actually editing the HTML on the Canvas page. Whereas what, what um, um, he's referring to is in Ally, it was kind of like an overlay. So the edit happened as long as the course was being part of the Ally integration. But as soon as it was imported or in a different instance of Canvas or whatever, an ally was no longer there, those edits that had been laboriously done were not there anymore. 
it didn't actually alter the edit of the HTML of the page. So another, another plug for Pope Tech. Okay, what else about accessibility? Last chance for today, not forever. Okay, I think I have one more live online. Some questions that came up about live online and it's a big topic and it has not been officially addressed in the rubric. So we as a norming community can be starting to think about what do we want to do at you guys at your campuses. Um, in the questions that were specifically asked was, does real time content have to be recorded for later viewing? And which means then of course it has to be captioned. And so my understanding for accessibility is if something is a one-time thing, it wouldn't need to be captioned. It could be recorded, but not captioned. However, there's the consideration that if that's the instructor's lecture for the week, how is the hearing impaired student gonna get that content if the video isn't um, captioned or if a live person isn't provided for the uh, student to attend the Zoom session live. So there's not a single answer it, to my understanding, and certainly I'm not the, uh, an expert on this. So if somebody has information about that, please feel free to chime in. And in terms of synchronous recordings, FERPA is a consideration about, you know, if you're using a, a lecture from last term, and student identities are discernible in that lecture, it would be a FERPA violation. So the instructor needs to be thinking about how they're gonna set things up in such a way if they are planning to record and have it be sort of an evergreen piece of content, they need to make sure there's a way where they can in, um, make sure that students are not identifiable in that context or that, that lecture. I don't know of the specific workaround. I do know people are doing it. And I think, I wish Michelle were here because I think she had a suggestion in her humanizing online learning about it, but I can't remember. Um, and I think Zoom is also updating their settings. So there's a way to turn off student names and things. And maybe, even, I don't know, you'd have to look at your Zoom settings, but those things are always changing. So um, teaching instructors to be thinking about FERPA, if they're gonna make an evergreen, and then also be to be looking at the Zoom settings and thinking about, okay, how could I set this up? If I plan to lecture, what, what's a way I could do this so that my current students are getting the benefit and I could turn it into an evergreen thing without violating FERPA. I don't have an answer. The, um, and if somebody does, and Bernadette, do you, do you got something to add about this? That's exactly right. what I was, yeah. When you mentioned the FERPA violations, what yeah. I have done is I will record this session. If I, if at the end of the class, when it's just Q and A, then I stop the recording. But even during the lecture, because there are going to be times when I pause and check for understanding, right. if students' faces, their names, or their voices are featured, then those are the pieces that I'll delete out so that they are protected because they didn't sign up for this. They signed up to be a student, right. but not to be on display. But, um, but then students can also ask me, okay, so what was the discussion or what, was the, what were the questions? I kind of try to summarize and capture what they missed if they weren't there, but that way it just protects students from being on display Great. in perpetuity. Yeah, thank you for sharing Absolutely. your strategy. Yep. Uh, what else? How does a math instructor, for example, need to annotate an example they may be doing on a whiteboard in Zoom? How are they gonna annotate it? And are there other fields that have similar issues? And this is kind of an open question for our community. Does anybody have, um, like Bernadette just shared, a, a way you your math instructors or your chemistry or whoever, something they've done so that what they're doing in the live session in Zoom is made accessible. Uh, Bethany, you got something to add? Sorry, <laughs> my click isn't wanting to click. Um, yeah, I wanted to 
just ask for a bit of clarification regarding the, the videos. Um, and I, I thought I heard something about the recycling of lecture videos mm -hmm. in synchronous classes. And I'm not sure if it was mentioned that my understanding was that was not something we could do where we use pre-recorded lectures for a synchronous class because that turns it into a correspondence course and there's conflicts with financial aid requirements. I'm not aware of that. I don't keep up on that level of DE guideline. I, I don't know why that would necessarily be true. Sean, I saw you shaking your head. Do you, do you have? No, you're you're good to go. You're good to go with um, lectures that you've recorded in the past and you reuse them. So um, for this, synchronous class for an asynchronous class. Yeah, no, no, no. For a synchronous class. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said class, no, for an asynchronous class, you can okay. do pre recorded lectures. So that's not an issue. But I think we need to make the differentiation for a synchronous class, a student who has signed up and is required to be in a classroom at specified times. Posting recordings is something you're doing because you're being really nice. Technically, you don't have to do that at all. That would be like them not showing up in the classroom that day right. when they're required to be there. So, yeah, it doesn't make sense. My understanding is if it is a synchronous class, you cannot recycle old videos because that turns it into correspondence courses. And that's an issue with financial aid. Well, what I would think you could probably do, as long as you're presenting the live lecture, because that would just be silly to force students to be there on Zoom when you're just going to mail it in. Um, but if you're doing the live thing, but it's this exact same lecture, you know, maybe you're somebody like me and you read notes when you do your webinars, it's the exact same thing as what you did before. That recording could be posted, but not in lieu of showing up during the live synchronous time to be with students. Okay. And so presumably because you're there with a new set of students, it's probably not gonna be the exact same questions and the exact same content. Right. But um, yeah, so live and, and asynchronous. So as, long as, as long as you're still holding your live sessions, you could then post a recording that maybe isn't even a recording of a live session. It's just you giving you, the yeah. lecture. Right. And then Again, you wouldn't run comparable. into Yeah. And then you wouldn't run into all those problems of right. student names or student faces. Um, and that may take out some of the um, problems that people are having yeah. right now. So just and, do a pre recorded lecture of just you. Right and then do your live synchronous. Okay. And Thanks. Bernadette couple with Bernadette's idea of if there were questions for this group of students, summarize it, do a little tail end to your recording or, or a little separate recording that's a summary of the questions that were asked or whatever so that this group of students is getting their own customized addendum to the stock lecture that you've posted. Jennifer. I have a question. So at Saddleback, we've only been reviewing fully online courses. Yep. And I'm confused on why we're talking about live online because this isn't, we don't even review those, right? Are we just talking about best practices in general, not something that we would actually use the rubric to evaluate? Correct. Well, technically, and Cheryl and I differ on this, fully online can mean live online. Because they're online, they're in Zoom, so it's a it's a a, a non in per you know non classroom based thing. So it is fully online. However, the rubric has not yet added in any kind of criteria to deal with the differences or the the additional considerations an instructor who is incorporating live sessions into their asynchronous course right yeah um so we we haven't addressed that yet but i think it is a question that is coming up and something that the rubric is probably going to need to address we just haven't figured out quite how but you're right jennifer we are not talking about hybrid or anything like that we're only talking about things that are fully online, online. but a live online course depending on how it's done could technically qualify as live online Hopefully that didn't muddy the water. Okay. Well, good. it's a little muddy because it's got to be a fully online asynchronous course that can be reviewed with the rubric with right. 
live online requirement. Components. Yeah. 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 So um, back to that question about math instructors. Anybody have ideas about how an instructor has perhaps provided what they're doing on a whiteboard for a student that is perhaps vision imp impaired. I'm not enough of an accessibility person to have an idea for that. It may be something that um, you'd need to contact the Accessibility Center or the Campus DSPS for ideas about that. Yeah, Michael. Um, my previous institution, I never got to use it before I switched and came to Lake Tahoe, but uh, one uh, statistics instructor it doesn't help with the live aspect of it, but what he was doing was um, doing sharing his screen and doing all his annotations on OneNote, and then OneNote will actually transcribe uh -huh. whatever you're writing into an accessible accessible format. Right. Okay. One way, one way, and since we all have access to, I believe we all have access to Microsoft. So uh huh. We, um, that's one way to, I mean, it's not the best solution, but sometimes yeah. it's not always the best. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks for sharing that. All right, okay, we're starting to wrap up. So what I want to check in with you, if we offered quick 15, 20 minute, very topic specific webinar trainings, is this a format that you or your review teams would find useful and attend. And, you know, I, I don't know what, I mean, it might be a specific rubric item, it could be access, you know, we're just trying to figure out what are some other ways that we can support the norming of, um, or faculty, but really more for review teams. Okay, so it seems like you guys like that. Okay, good. Now, Question, and you don't have to answer now, you can send me or Cheryl or Sean an email. What topics would be most helpful to you and your review team in terms of norming, in terms of what is the best way to train, you know, what do we need to train faculty on, whatever it is. So it, again, might be a specific rubric topic, might be how to do an accessibility review, you know, whatever it is. So you could put it in chat, but what would probably be better is if you can, email one of us and tell us what topics you would find useful. And when you say samples, Peter, samples of what? So that's the kind of specificity that we would be helpful for us in preparing whatever it is we're gonna put together for you. And I will copy the chat so that um, I can grab what's being put there, but do feel free to email. Um, okay. Last call for questions or comments about norming stuff. Uh, Meg, yes. Thanks, Helen. I was just wondering if there was a way we could maybe in future, in the future, um, have local norming so that my reviewers who weren't able to make it to this session, I could still have a chance to catch them up and we could get some credit for them being normed, so to speak, um, even though they might not be able to make it to something like this. Mm -hmm. In, okay, interesting idea. We'll, I'll, we'll bring it up for consideration and figure out how that might be able to work. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, Cheryl and Sean, make note. Um, Cynthia. Hi, yeah, I, I just wanted to, um, I guess it would be a great thing to add on this norming is kind of just understanding, um, I didn't want to jump in with the accessibility stuff with the publisher question because we understand what how you addressed it there with regard to we have to check the accessibility. Um, but some of my faculty that use it when we get into you know sections um, B and C were concerned about, for instance, instructions on assignments. My suggestion was, you know, adding a canvas page that precedes them linking into the publisher right. content. But when they're, um, and then the alignment of objectives and listing those objectives, right. um, when we send it in for review, um, is it best to maybe just ask them to take a screenshot of what the publisher content looks like so that the reviewers can see that? I, that's where we're at, because I have already given right. them suggestions on how to okay. help it align, but. Okay, great. So it's how to 
demonstrate the alignment mm -hmm. so that a review, yeah. Screenshot would work if it's something that is screenshotable. Another thing that we have done many times is the instructor will make an appointment with the reviewer and walk them through. So they just have a live, you know, 15 minute or however long it takes. And the, the few items that the reviewer would need to see like instructions or whatever, um, the instructor just shows them, here's what it looks like in the publisher. And the reviewer could say, oh, okay, that works fine. Or, oh, here's what I would like you to do in Canvas. So either of those would, would work. Okay, perfect, thanks. You bet. Another option, which most people don't do, is the instructor could give their login credentials so that the reviewer would be able to go. But, you know, that, that's a whole um, privacy thing. And so they usually prefer to do a little tour with the reviewer. Okay, Moses. Real quick A4 question that basically came up yesterday. Uh, for the first time I've had a faculty uh, submit um, with modules as the homepage, which is not how how we train. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not really our local standard, um, mm -hmm. but I noticed that on the course design resources course, there's a note in there that's you know some campuses do this, and uh, we Rhea and I were like looking for some direction in terms of whether uh, you know we would like to maybe hold to requiring a front page because it's better web design essentially. Right. Um, is there a, is there kind of a direction on that? Um, what I, when I'm working with somebody in course design resources, and it's often the very straightforward, just the facts, ma'am kind of instructor, you know, they don't see the need to be all flowery and, and welcoming. They just want their students to get right to it. What I will recommend is fine for your first week. I'm going to ask that you have a warm, welcoming, warm and fuzzy homepage that is something that can have your picture or what, you know, whatever. And then tell your students at the end of this week, we're going to go to have the homepage be the modules and you can just dive straight in kind of a, a compromise so that for those because there are students who are very put off by that very unwelcoming list of stuff yeah. it also can be overwhelming and so we want to meet the needs of all of our students and that could be one compromise for people that really want to have the modules be their home page um, but it also helps that first week jitters and anxiety it helps allay it for students that need a bit more structure and warmth to be able to connect yeah so strictly from an a form for alignment perspective it's okay for them to use modules but it's but I'm I'm totally with you. Actually, this is what I tell in the non in the non uh, course quality review training standpoint when people come to me with this, or when I do a waiver with them, I say like that's fine. But please, for week one, among other things, put the tech support links here. Right. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that answers my question. And the only thing about if they're just having their modules is they need to make sure that they have a naming convention that is very clear, mm -hmm. and that they have a very clear start here because that's part of A4 is that in our norming right. is that the student knows exactly where they're supposed to start. And yes, the, the typical person is going to start on the first page, but there may be a student who thinks, oh, I don't need to go to that unless it says start here. So that you just want to different related conversation, but yeah, uh, excellent. yeah Thank you. exactly. But so just so the, uh, the instructor understands that it's really clear to the student how to navigate the modules area if they're not being given any other guidance. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Bree. All right. Thank you. I just want to echo what Meg said about maybe some sort of alternative to this. I have one faculty member in particular who it lives in England. He's a fabulous mm. reviewer, really thorough. But this is just but he's sleeping. Well, yeah. He, yeah, he's getting to that point. You know, <laughs> noon for us is you know what eight o'clock at night. So yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, okay, great. We got a couple more minutes. Anything else that uh, comment or a question to bring up? Yes, T and you'll have to correct me on your name, Tijal. Angel, thank you, Helen. Um, just wanted to again ask if we could have these sessions um, maybe later in the evening or on Fridays because this is prime time for our instructors. You know, we have courses scheduled Monday to Thursday between the, during this time slot. So yeah, just a I mean, suggestion. We can think. The reason we don't do Fridays is because everybody else has their like Deco and consortium and, you know, everybody in the system seems to have their system wide meetings on Fridays because of that. 
Um, so it, it's and nights. Nights, maybe after three or four. Yeah, it's just a dash. I mean, I, I mean, I understand you have so many other things to look at, but uh, yeah. Well, you're making a plug for what you need. Okay, so we, yeah, we'll we'll revisit this idea and see what we can fig if there's anything we can figure out. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay. Well, hopefully you got some good stuff out of today. I appreciate everyone that has shared either in chat or uh, verbally. Really nice conversation. If you have questions or anything, um, let us know. You've got those resources that we shared earlier, the course design resources shell, as well as the local poker resource center, which has a ton of stuff on it. Let us know how we can help you and we'll be keeping in touch and we'll see you at the next norming session in April or April or May. Now I don't remember what date it was, but May. May. Okay, thank you. I'll see you in May. All right. May Bye, May. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Oh, I got a copy chat before I go. Cheryl, are you still here? No, okay.